The concept I'm proposing for the dictionary of war is magician. In the context of magicians and warfare, there are a number of magics that I will not be discussing here. I will not, for instance, be exploring Adolf Hitler's well-documented interest in the magic of astrology and the occult in relation to the fate of the Third Reich before the Second World War. Nor will I be discussing the magical prayer life of George W. Bush and his miraculous personal conversion to Christianity by this man, Arthur Blessed, an evangelist who's been walking with this cross around the globe for the last 20 years, seen here in Baghdad in 1998. A ghost moving quietly through this paper will be Jean Baudrillard, although his invocation in 1991 of the illusory nature of the first Gulf War in the Gulf War did not happen, will also not be discussed at length here. What I do want to bring into view in relation to this meditation on the unstable language and discourse surrounding contemporary warfare is what cultural historian Simon During has termed secular magic, or what could also be called theatrical magic. That is the magic of the stage illusionist or conjurer, a much under-considered figure of agency in modernity and post-modernity. In Modern Enchantments, During notes, once we fully recognize secular magic's role as a cultural agent, our sensitivity to the play of puzzlement, fictiveness, and contingency in modernity will be greatly heightened. How do magicians feature, then, in the topography of warfare? How, where, and why are they deployed? Professional magicians are accomplished illusion designers, tactical misdirectors of visual and verbal information. The space in which they operate is an architecture of carefully staged spectacularity. As a willful and motivated fabricator of deception, a magician's role is to present one account of reality while the contingency of another takes quite a different and effective course. As such, magicians are unusually well equipped to support and contribute to the strategies of governments at war. Terms such as faint, dazzle, mask, decoy, ruse. All these terms have mutual currency within the strategies of deception in warfare and the methodology of theatrical magic performance. You've just seen Peruvian-born illusionist Ricciardi performing on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1958. Although the history of deception in warfare is as old as warfare itself, perhaps, the relationship between the state and modern theatrical magic begins most emphatically with the story of French magician Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin. According to his memoirs in 1858, Houdin assisted in the suppression of a colonial uprising in northern Algeria at the request of the French government in 1856. French victory was assured after Houdin's demonstration of well-known stage illusions at the time, including the bullet catch the heavy and light case and the inexhaustible bottle proved decisive in a battle of will with the Algerian magician Zoras Al-Kahim, whose significantly less spectacular illusions, eating glass and walking on hot coals, had previously been seen all-powerful in the eyes of the Algerian public. In the United States in 1898, John Wilkie was appointed head of the Secret Service two weeks after a bomb had killed 260 American soldiers aboard the battleship Maine. His brief was to coordinate counter-espionage operations against the Spanish who had been blamed for the carnage. Wilkie was an accomplished magician and immediately employed theatrical impresario Bob Fitzsimmons, also a magician, as an operative to successfully discredit Spanish spies working on American soil. It's recently been demonstrated that Wilkie was also the writer behind the hoax that became the now-established myth of the Indian rope trick, a fiction he created and sustained during his time as a newspaper correspondent at the Chicago Tribune eight years earlier in 1890, 
a colonialization of wonderment, in other words, via the printed word and image. In a recently published biography by William Kalush and Larry Sloman, Harry Houdini is alleged to have assisted the British Secret Service in the build-up to the First World War, using his celebrity and access within the theatre world during his tours of Russia and Germany to pass information back to William Melville, head of Scotland Yard's special branch in London. Stories of this kind abound within the magic community, and often with some foundation in truth, since the threshold between the magic world and criminal fraternities has historically been permeable and remains so. One magician who certainly did play a role during the Second World War was Jasper Maskelin, grandson of John Neville Maskelin, one of the most successful in, uh, magician impresarios in England during magic's golden era at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Jasper Maskelin's story is widely known. He worked in North Africa as part of a counterintelligence unit called A-Force, or more informally, the Magic Gang. Under the leadership of Maskelin, this collective of theatre professionals, magicians and artists developed a particular genre of military decoy known as sun shields, which were capable of disguising one type of military vehicle as another, and which included a system for disguising the vehicle's varying sand mark tracks. The history of the decoy itself is a fascinating narrative of simulations and substitutions, of appearances and vanishes. This tank was used as a model for some of the earliest decoy designs during World War II, but was itself a fake and had begun its life in Sound City as part of a film set. Decoys survive in the theatre of operations to this day, mostly as lightweight inflatables now, some of which include internal pockets of hot air to simulate the heat signatures of real vehicles. Decoys feature in a story of mutual illusion that has become something of a military urban legend. In occupied Holland during 1941, witnesses reported that a decoy airfield constructed entirely from wood to distract British bombers from their intended targets had indeed been attacked by the British, but using wooden bombs. This story turns out to have been an unapproved but nevertheless leaked rumour created by the, under, the underground propaganda unit in London. The story is now retold in many countries, its ubiquity and non-allegiance to any particular territory or conflict suggesting a ludic continuum in the face of the traumatising reality of actual conflict. Here we see another example of a fictitious airfield photographed in northwest Germany where painted bomb craters attempted to disguise a fully functional airstrip. Because of their technical expertise, magicians and theatre professionals were employed formally throughout both world wars within strategic deception units. Here, the use of theatrical scrim is being explored as a means of disguise at one of the UK-based camouflage schools. It was noted that military strategists often thought and planned predictably, whereas magicians lie like real human beings and were therefore more effective in strategizing certain aspects of deceptions, particularly when it came to propaganda. Counterfeiting, one of magic's sibling arts, was employed continuously for covert operations during World War II under the direction of another ex-journalist, Dennis Sefton Delmo head of the political warfare executive in Great Britain. This packet of cigarette papers contained detailed instructions in German on how to fake illness, or in English, to malinger, so that German soldiers could ac accurately represent themselves as unfit to fight, therefore depleting the German ranks from within. The cigarette papers were paced streak secretly in the pockets of soldiers by agents trained in put-pocketing, the reverse of pick-pocketing, another performance skill that falls within the informal training of most magicians. 
Magicians who were closer to the center of power included, in Germany, the Jewish astrologer, showman, and stage magician, Erich Jan Hanussen. Hanussen's story is well known here as Hitler's personal clairvoyant who predicted the young chancellor's rise to power but was assassinated in late April 1933 after successfully but indiscreetly predicting the events of the Reichstag fire. Hitler's ambiguous saying, great liars are also great magicians, could well have referred in part to Hanussen. Close to the British Prime Minister was this man, magician Harry Green, who on one occasion held Winston Churchill away from a crucial strategy meeting because Churchill wanted to know the secret behind a card trick known as Out of This World. Churchill, seen here on the pages of the Demon Telegraph in 1944, was na naturally possessed of an inventive and devious mind and was fascinated by the role of deception in warfare after his experiences in World War I, building a wooden version of the British fleet to distract enemy submarines. Operation Overlord at the close of World War II and overseen by Churchill remains an acknowledged masterpiece of tactical misdirection. The victim is cheated, Churchill said, by his own conceptions of the limits of reality. Due to paper shortages, the Demon Telegraph was the only magazine to remain in print within the magic community in the United Kingdom during World War II. Within its pages, many magic routines with conflict-related iconography were described, often parodying the German Führer himself. Here is a gas mask prop which turns inside out to reveal a small plaster model of Hitler's head, a gas bag. Another performance idea involved a playing card designed from the features of the Führer himself. Here's what that trick would have looked like when it was performed. Such material provided moral ammunition for magicians performing in England to public audiences and for magicians who were abroad performing to soldiers as part of the Entertainment National Service Association. In the United States, magician John Mulholland's book, The Art of Illusion, was reissued as an armed service edition so that it could be carried in the shirt pockets of soldiers for their entertainment and diversion. This tiny volume contains simple trick routines, but offers us in, respect, uh, in retrospect an inadvertent postmodern image, that of young soldiers being pulled from the field of battle carrying blood-soaked books on the art of illusion. During the Cold War, Mulholland's patriotism became more complex. His own face appears in the illustrations of another magic book entitled some operational uses for the art of deception commissioned by the CIA for M. Coulter, the notorious program established to explore the tactical use of hallucinogenics in warfare in an attempt to narrow the perceived mind control gap that was developing between America and its Cold War adversaries. The purpose of this paper, Mulholland wrote in 1954, is to instruct the reader so that he may learn to perform a variety of acts secretly and undetectably. In short, here are instructions for deception. Essentially, this was a text on how to use magic to kill. The document describes tricks with pills, tricks with loose solids, tricks with liquids, tricks by which small objects may be obtained secretly. And one section gave modified techniques that could be performed by female aid agents. This image from the CIA document shows how a poison pill can be deposited into a drink, shown not very clearly, unfortunately, in the black circle, using simple misdirection as part of a gesture of striking a match and lighting an enemy's cigarette. The circumstances recently 
of the death of Alexander Litvinenko via polonium poisoning in a London restaurant suggests that some of these techniques may not have lost their efficacy. By the, by the early 1960s, popular culture had become fascinated by this juxtaposition of the magician and state power, distilled here in the form of the short-lived character of John Force, a magic agent who possessed a crypto-scientific device that enabled the invocation of extrasensory perception, telepathy, illusions, and hypnosis. Maskelyne's illusory tank decoys appear here in ghost form as armored units summoned by John Force's palm device. New technologies also feature, such as seeing through walls, technologies that were fantasies in the 1960s but are now commonplace on the modern battlefield. John Force is an exemplar of the magician operating at the service of the state. His expertise, metaphorically compressed into a single handheld device, co-opted to support the prevailing hegemonic order. The pillar of telepathy, for example, translates to one of the pillars of the edifice of state on a device that is itself a small White House. Were there any magicians, one might ask, who resisted the implementation of their expertise in this way, who insisted, who instead used their skills in opposition to the prevailing political order of their time? During the anti-war marches in the mid-1960s, Abby Hoffman invited over 335,000 anti-war protesters to Washington to join hands around the Pentagon in order to levitate it, and once levitated, tilt the building at 45 degrees. Ex-Vietnam combatant Jim Shannon's proposed 1st Earth Battalion in the mid-1970s applied a New Age tools such as meditation, shiatsu, and futurology to battlefield protocol. As, journalist, British, as British journalist John Ronson has recently demonstrated, some of Channon's methods did in fact enter the theatre of war in the form of the now common sonic barrages often used to break sieges. Fidel Castro's use of stage magic conventions are a much clearer connection. During his acceptance speech after his assumption to power in Havana in 19, 1959, Java doves a type favored by magicians because of their size, flew into the air and landed on Castro's hands and shoulders. Research has been undertaken recently to identify the woman to Castro's right, who might in fact have been the stage assistant of a well-known Cuban magician. Doves, however, do not fly in this way of their own accord, so Castro, or a man that the dove would recognize, the doves would recognize as Castro, would have to train the doves for several days in advance of the performance that we see here. Within a Catholic country, the doves were read immediately as a symbol of Christian acceptance. Fidel Castro's use of trained doves to affirm the left's opposition to the United States in the late 1950s draws us into the issue of magic's relationship to spectacularity and the ethics of the encounter between the viewer and performer, between electorate and state. Magic used in warfare, as I have been describing, could be termed more accurately as deception, since the audience is always unaware that the magic is taking place. You may recall that magician John Mulholland was careful to make this distinction. His first book, intended to teach soldiers how to entertain using magic, was called The Art of Illusion. His second book, intended for use by the, I, by the, uh, by the CIA, was called The Art of of deception. This distinction between, the de between deception and illusion is considered from a slightly different perspective in a recent book entitled Dream, Reimagining Progressive Politics in an Age of Fantasy, the New Press, 2007. Here, activist Stephen Duncombe implies that one of the reasons that the left has failed to motivate electorates in our era is because of its historical commitment to enlightenment notions of truth and a quantifiable real. Because of this ideological legacy, 
the use of fabulation and spectacularity to shake the will of the electorate is considered reprehensible. The progressive left has therefore become known for placard-carrying mass marches and long speeches on poorly constructed stages, events that Duncombe describes as bad theatre. In contrast, the right has successfully captured the hearts and minds of the majority by a constant and spectacular reinvention of reality. For the right, Duncombe suggests, reality has only ever been a provisional experience, a, a provisional concept, a, a fact that we know from examples elsewhere in history, particularly in this country. A dedication to fantasy in the political and public realm is, of course, consistent with the employment of ex-Hollywood executive Scott Sorza in the current White House Art Department, choreographing audacious backdrops and banners for George W. Bush, seen here juxtaposed against two leaders who have actually won a war. These carefully staged photographic sight lines find parallels in the controlled sight lines which magicians use in the, constructive, in the construction of an effective stage illusion. It is perhaps too easy to know which contemporary magicians are advising within the current administration regarding military strategy, invisibility being a prerequisite of magic consultants worldwide. Karl Rove's nickname in the White House, of course, during the first crucial years of the Bush administration was the magician. But magic stagecraft was certainly apparent at the Republican Convention in New York in 2004, when Bush appeared from behind two screens, pushed across the stage by glamorous assistants using a technique that perhaps only an illusionist could have suggested. In October 2003, in Baghdad's Central Square, the Real America Display Company, a subsidiary of Halliburton's corporation, unveiled from beneath a black tarpaulin after weeks of suspense a huge video screen for the edification of the Iraqi population. The second surprise, however, was the image on the screen, America's first live outdoor televisual presence in central Iraq was a live feed of magician David Blaine laying in his suspended box during his notorious London performance of As Above, So Below. Within minutes, the bulletproof screen had attracted gunfire. In the context of this paper, the layered semiotics of this scenario are of interest. Here is the mediated image of a Jewish-American magician in the process of eluding with live magic a largely anti-war British public coming under heavy and probably pro-Palestinian gunfire in central Baghdad. Throughout the conflict, Blaine has continued to entertain American troops on the ground level in Israel and also in the United States, seen here at Brook Army Medical University. I want to move for a moment back to Stephen Duncombe's argument. In his book, Duncan condemns the right's audacious use of deceptive spectacle using the term delusion. However, he also suggests that the left cannot afford forever to forget the spectacular appetites of the electorate, who must dream in order to live. The left must therefore construct what he calls, in a troubling phrase, forms of ethical spectacle, spectacle that might, to paraphrase Walter Littman in, in a slightly better phrase, engineer disconsent. The term he chooses to contrast with delusion is, and here we come back to magic, the term illusion, which he defines as transparent spectacle, a pleasurable parade of artificiality. Duncombe asks, what would a self-conscious, transparent spectacle translated into progressive politics look like? In other words, can we use illusions to fight deceptions, to fight the deceptions and delusions of our time? 
Well, that's a lot of slides and um, a little bit of theory. Um, I'd like to turn some theory into practice and, um, and test Duncombe's theory here. I have two examples that I'm going to use to, uh, to illustrate these points. Um, I first want to use an item that's been very gener generously lent to me by a colleague, Ian Tomlinson, who is the Deputy Curator of Collections at the Imperial War Museum in London. This item is something of a relic in the museum archives. It was donated by a British soldier after World War II who had been personally detained a notorious SS officer at the end of the war. The officer in question, Michael Brennan, had a reputation as a particularly brutal interrogator. So the soldier decided to keep one of Brennan's gloves as a souvenir. I'm going to use this rather unpleasant object to test Duncombe's theory that illusion is stronger than delusion. So first of all, we need a delusion. We need a deception. We need a lie. Let's start with that fictional story I've just told you about a glove which in fact I brought earlier this afternoon in Alexander Platzer. Compare that delusion, that deception, with this illusion. Which is more powerful and which is more useful to us? <laughs> Can you hear me okay or do I need a microphone? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. The second example, I'm going to use this drill and this hat. This hat, in this illustration, will represent one of the most sustained ongoing delusions of our time, which is the detainment centre at Guantanamo Bay. When you look at me, I want you to think of one of the guards at Guantanamo Bay. We're going to use this illusion device to test the experiment upon this delusion. Now, I need you to help me with this, so no conscientious objectives, please. You can see me, but if you inside it, I can't see you. You want to move it to the centre in my help. So we're going to test this delusion using this illusion device. What I want you to do is to focus into the center of this disc. Okay? I'm going to turn it around. Okay? I want you to keep your eye on the center of the disc. And I'm going to count down from 10. And when I get to 1, I want you to look from the disc straight away up to my head. And remember, we're trying to reveal the bloated, inflated egos of the guards at Guantanamo Bay. Okay, so focus into the center. I know you may not want to, you may feel like you're being manipulated, but remember this is an illusion, not a delusion. So enjoy the shape of the spiral moving inwards. Just keep looking at it, right into the center, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. Okay, I'm going to count to ten, and when I get to one, I want you to look straight up to my head. Okay, here we go. Ten, nine, eight, keep looking, seven, six, Five, four, keep looking, three, two, one, and then look at my head.
reduce it to the size of a pea. Okay? Those of you who didn't look last time, I encourage you to look this time. Remember we're participating in a long history of magic and, and the military in a kind of fatal marriage. So. so let your eyes relax. Look straight into the center of the disc. Enjoy the spiral moving outwards. Keep looking, just let your eyes relax. Okay, here we go. Keep looking. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Keep looking. Five. Keep looking. Four. Three, two, one, look at my head. <laughs>